Hey, there we go. Okay, it always makes me very uncomfortable to be introduced as an expert in JavaScript. I don't feel like those people exist. All right, because how many of you write JavaScript? How many of you feel like you're an expert at JavaScript any day? Right, right, that's exactly right, because it's not possible. Um, you guys, we're gonna have fun. Like, yeah. you're so close. Um, okay, so real quick before I start, uh, who in the room ha is um, purely a JavaScript developer, as in you do not develop in any other language at all? All right, that's about what I expected. Okay, I'm getting too many like, maybe? Okay, so who does .NET in addition to JavaScript? All right, you don't have to clap that. Um, <laughs> who does Java in addition? All right, any Ruby? Python, I had, I had two. One of you was much more excited about Ruby than the other one. Um, what did I miss? Did I miss anything? PHP, okay, excellent. Uh, any, anybody morally opposed to hand raising? I, okay, I always get like two. Um, okay, <coughs> so because I'm gonna ask a lot of questions and I wanna make sure that you guys are comfortable like shouting out answers. Um, okay, uh, like I said, how many of you are, um, there, how many of you are JavaScript developers? This is, like, this pretty much defines the JavaScript development <laughs> lifetime, right? Um, oh my goodness, because at any given time, we exist in this state of, I think everything's broken, but right now, like, this thing works, so I don't want to mess with it. Because if I mess with it, it'll break, and, and everything around it doesn't work. Um, so the idea of this talk is most of us, although there's a, there's a pack of you right in the middle back there that don't fit this definition, but it'll be okay. Um, most of us work in multiple languages, right? Most of us build these great, beautiful, architected backends in C Sharp, or Java or something, and we abide by these solid principles. How many of you have heard the term solid before today? All right, how many of you have heard the term solid with respect to JavaScript? Okay, so a few of you, much less of you, and that doesn't surprise me whatsoever, because we build these awesome .NET or Java or Ruby or whatever backends, and we think very strongly about them and, and architect them very thoroughly, and then we get to our JavaScript. And our JavaScript doesn't look <laughs> nearly as good as our backend. Because JavaScript typically, well, as we said, in JavaScript typically the idea is how can I make it work? Uh, you know, so I'll, and usually when it does work, we don't necessarily always know why it works. Um, right? Have you ever had that? Like, uh, this shouldn't work. And I don't know why it does. But it works, so don't mess with it. Right? Because once you'll never get it back again. Uh, so we end up with JavaScript like this, and that, that's just not right. So, um, so the purpose of this talk is, is to kind of make us evaluate that same framework, those same solid principles that we apply on the back end, and start thinking about them on, on our front end code, our JavaScript code, so we can apply a little bit more rigor and structure and thought to what it is we're doing. Okay, so. Many of you have said you'd heard the term solid before, so we'll just talk very quickly about what that means. <coughs> so solid, um, five design principles intended to make software designs more understandable, flexible, and maintainable. All right, so it's just a bunch of principles um, that are gonna make us think a little bit. I'll talk about more of that in just a second. I'm not gonna, uh, so there's this great series of, uh, how many of you, demotivational cartoons, right? Have you seen these things, right? So there was a great series of them that were on the uh, Los Techies blog for a while in Solid, so I stole them. There's, I'm giving them credit for these, these are not mine, uh, talking about Solid, so I'm gonna use those. So um, the five principles are single responsibility principle. Have you heard that before? Single responsibility means things do one thing, 
right? You've got the open-close principle. You've got Liskov substitution principle. Now they get weird, right? I, we don't know what that is. Um, interface segregation and dependency inversion. So I'm going to walk through these, and we're going to kind of apply some of these thoughts to the JavaScript side. Okay, so this is for this talk. This is my thought, and this is what I want you to walk away with. Solid principles are just a means of forcing us to stop and think about the right way of doing something. Right, so instead of just work till something gets right, like let's stop for a second. Let's think about the right way to do something and then start to begin to implement that. Okay, hold on, before we go too far. Um, especially when we start talking about like, uh, dependency inversion and all of those types of things. Somebody's going to say, um, this is JavaScript, this is not .NET. We don't have abstract classes. We don't have, you know, all of these things that we have in other languages. And so I'm, I have to clarify, this is my disclaimer. As we get into some of this code, um, I want you to keep in mind that we're applying principles, we're not applying like strict things. So on the back end, we might be talking about abstract classes. On the front end, we're going to try and adapt it to mean something in JavaScript. So if you're Mary, like if you're a dogmatic, solid person, you're going to be really frustrated by the time we're done here. So sorry. Um, <laughs> deal with it. Um, all right. On the next year, there'll be a talk at Utah JS. All the reasons John was wrong about solid JavaScript. Just submit it. That's fine. You'll get in. Um, Okay, single responsibility. So, so the whole rest of this talk, I'm just going to walk through each of these things. And we're going to talk about what they are and how they work and how we're going to implement them. Um, so the first one is single responsibility. How many of you have ever worked with code that looks like this? Um, right, just because you can doesn't mean you should. So basically the idea of the single responsibility principle is this. Every module or class should have a single part of the functionality that's provided by the software, and it's, that responsibility should be entirely encapsulated by the class. So basically what this means, you can read the last sentence if you want to, I'm not going to. Basically what this means is it should have one reason to change. So this is the official term. You have a piece of code, and that piece of code should only ever have one reason to change. If you have multiple things going on in this piece of code, something's wrong. Because ultimately, what happens when you change something? Just by definition, you guys are, it's, it's gonna break, right? Right, anytime you change something, things will break. And so you wanna minimize the number of times you have to reach in and change something. So the first thing is, everything should have a single reason to change. So, okay, I'm gonna show you something, and tell me if you've ever written something that looks like this. Um, okay, so this is React. React developers in the room, I know I'm curious. Okay, I assume all the non-React developers are next door in Kent's talk, um, <laughs> learning about React, but you're all welcome in here. Uh, so, okay, React developers, I want you to notice a couple things. In my um, React component, I'm reaching out, I'm getting some data from a third party, you know, from an API, I'm pulling that back, I'm loading it into state, and then down here, I'm looping over that, how many things is this doing? Is it doing more than one thing? How many of you have done this before, first of all? Right, and half of you are lying to me, um, right? Because this is normal, it's, and it works. You would be hard pressed to convince me that this doesn't work just fine. I can go out, I can go get data, it's part of my component, I can pull that data back, I can drop it in, that's fine. What happens when my API changes? What happens when my shape of my data changes? What happens when any of these things, now I have to crack open my component and I have to start making changes to it? What happens if the way I want to display the data changes? Now I've got to crack open this part down here and I've got to make changes to that. So now I've got multiple reasons to reach in here and start dealing with this component. So how do we fix that? Anybody, wild guess. Um, okay, so I had one vote for Redux. Um, 
So, right. <coughs> no, Redux is fine. No, like if you use Redux, that's cool. Totally use Redux. If you're using Redux because you have one component that makes one API call, you're a glutton for punishment. Um, <laughs> the, the vast majority, so as a consultant, um, I see a lot of code. And I see a lot of people who have like two or three pages that are using Redux, and they're like, I, Redux is hard. And it's like, well, why are you using it? Um, you're making one API call. Okay, yes, you could do that, or ideally you just rip all this stuff, pull all your API code out and stick it somewhere else. Stick it into a, a repository somewhere, or keep it up at a higher level, and then just pass everything down. So ultimately your components should just look like this, right? Keep everything out, pass everything down. You don't need this to worry about anything else except for how to display your data. Everything else should be somewhere else. Keep it out. Um, and so now you'll notice I'm just looping over props on books. I don't care. It doesn't matter. This actually then becomes, can become a stateless component. There's whole arguments about that. We can talk about that later. I'm not going to talk about it right now. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's ultimately single responsibility, right? You want to make sure everything has one reason to change. You want to make sure everything's pulled apart. Keep it separate. That starts to introduce some complexity though, right? Because I had one file that did everything. Now I have multiple files that do one thing. And so now I'm starting to, to add complexity to what I'm talking about. <coughs> so we enter the open-close principle. Uh, okay, so open-close, who, who wants to take a guess? What does open-close mean? Yes? Open for extension, close for modification. Open for extension, close for modification. Is he right? Yeah, yeah he. <laughs> I like your confidence. Excellent. Yes, I am correct in my answer. Um, you are correct, actually, in your answer. Um, right. So open chest surgery, not needed when putting on a coat, right? Okay, so before we can talk too much about the open-close principle, because right, the answer was open for extension, but close for modification. Software entities should be open for extension, so you were correct. I know you knew that already, but I'm just validating you again. Um, okay, but now we're talking about extension. And we're talking about JavaScript. And we're, ah, uh, right? So now we get into some interesting things because I don't use classes. Um, you can throw things at me, I, I don't care. Um, and, you know, so let's talk a little bit about inheritance and JavaScript. How many of you are aware and fully understand um, the, the ramifications and implications of, um, of prototypes. I, I like the like, maybe, because I asked like fully understand, right? And that was like, that makes it difficult. Um, so a lot of you did not raise your hand. I don't know if you were worried I was gonna call on you, but that's fine. Um, let's talk a little bit about what that means. Okay, so I have a function called task. And this function is gonna have two things, this.name and this.complete. Um, the fact that it has a capital T implies that you're going to new it up. Um, so just, so I have a function, we're going to new it up, and then I add two things to the prototype. So this task has two things on its prototype. One is complete, and what does it do? It's going to set the completed flag to true, and I'm going to spit something out to the console. That's all I'm going to do. Then um, I've got task.prototype.save, that's going to do nothing except write to the console. So that's obviously not production code, but you guys know what we're trying to work with here. So the prototype basically is this thing that all of the instances of tasks share. Right, so all the instances of tasks are gonna point back to the prototype. It doesn't make copies of them, it's got one of them sitting right here. Um, and so then when I new up a task, my task dot complete, my task dot save, completing tasks, saving tasks, everything's good. 
So we build this task. And your boss comes along. How many of you ever had, um, what do they call it? Requirements change. <laughs> right? Um, you've built this thing. This thing works. Oh, wait, 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 no. Um, we want to change this thing to now be able to handle priorities and urgent tasks. So if, if a task is deemed urgent, now I want it to do notifications. So when something gets completed, I want to notify somebody of something or I want to do some other things. Okay. How would you, how would you tackle this? Normally, because it's a simple change, right? What do we do? We open up task, we add a priority to it, then we add a notify option to the save. But wait, not everything is that, so now we've got to add some if logic in there. And we've taken this thing called task that was very simple and worked, and now we've made it complicated. And hard, and it's not going to work. So we're going to do something slightly different instead. Because task should be right. open for extension, close for modification. See, I can, OK. Um, that's the last time I'm going to point at you, I promise, except for this time that I'm doing it right now. OK. Um, so here's the fun part about JavaScript. So we were talking about JavaScript earlier. And, and the fun thing about JavaScript is that it, I was here last year. I did a talk on um, functional style JavaScript. Was, and did anybody happen to be in the room for that talk? OK, you got a few of you. Um, the rest of you didn't want to come to one of my talks again. So um, the idea is nothing is immutable in JavaScript, right? I can change everything. Whatever I want to do, I've got an object called task. Guess what? For my urgent stuff, I can just new up a new one, and then I can start adding stuff to it. Like .NET developers freak out when they see stuff like this. They're like, you can't add that. Oh, no, I can. I just say dot .priority and set it to 2, and I'm done. There's no model, there's no class. I don't have to deal with any of that stuff. I just do it. That's why I do JavaScript, right? Because I get it done quickly. Um, and then wonder why it doesn't work half the time. But, OK, that's separate. <laughs> so I also added notify, um, where I'm notifying important people. But now I have to modify save, right? <coughs> because I, when I save it, I want to call task save, but I also want it to run notify. So we have this kind of stuff. So I can, I can overwrite the save of this one object. And then I can notify. And then I can invoke t the, the save on task's prototype. So I can overwrite save on this thing and then call the prototype version of it. That'll be fine. And now I have this thing that's an urgent task that meets all of the requirements that I have. And this is horrible. Don't do this. But I'm just giving you an example of like how this could work. Because there's ultimately a better way. <coughs> because if I have one instance where I'm doing this, that's fine. If I have like 15 instances, or two even, I want to do it differently. Like I want to actually have a first class ta urgent task thing. And that's a fairly easy thing to accomplish. So I can create a new constructor function called urgent task. And then as part of that, I can just do a task.call, sending to this scope, and the name that came in. And now I have a task um, that doesn't have any of the prototype stuff on it. So we got to fix that. So I can actually just copy tasks prototype over to urgent tasks prototype. And now urgent task is exactly the same as task. I have extended it to a separate thing, and now I'm doing something different. I can go add my own stuff to notify or to the prototype, notify, save, and now I have a first class task that has extended, a first class urgent task that has extended task. And this will work in place of task everywhere, right? So 
where I still need task, have I changed any of the code that requires task at all anywhere? No. Have I changed, uh, but, but I now implemented the new requirement. So this is kind of the idea of open close. And it's a little bit of a simplistic example, but, it, but it's exactly the situation that we're talking about. I have something that works, don't change it. If you don't have to change something that works, don't change it. Because you'll never get back to it again. Like that, yeah. Okay. All right, so then now I can just create a new task, and it'll work. Okay. Now we get to this one. Who's heard of the Liskov substitution principle before? Very few of you, but a few. Who feels very confident that if I handed you the microphone, you could stand right here and explain it in detail to the group? People are volunteering each other, and I've got two. Okay, that's about what I expect. Okay, um, so I'm gonna pay attention. So if I mess this up, just like wave at me, and then we can, we can work on it, okay. Um, so, this sums up the Liskov substitution principle pretty, pretty clearly. Uh, who is Liskov and what is she trying to substitute? Um, okay, if I was to ask you this question, this is interesting. So how many of you um, have a computer-related degree? Much of you, computer science, computer engineering, CIS, any of those types of things, okay. Um, so I'm gonna take a, a full stop for just a minute because we're gonna talk about a person that you may not have ever heard of before. Um, so there's a woman by the name of Barbara Liskov. Um, so she's actually pretty awesome and I was pretty sad that I had never heard of her before I started like working on the solid stuff. Um, so she's a She's a professor at MIT. She's a computer science uh, doctorate from Stanford. She built the first programming languages that were built for distributed systems. She built the first object-oriented database. It's called Thor, by the way. It's kind of awesome. Um, and she has basically uh, paved the way for object-oriented programming and much of what you're doing today. How many of you have ever heard of her as a person before like this moment? Excellent, okay, more than I have seen at other events, so good for Salt Lake City, but, um, but not enough. Okay, so, she came up with this thing called the Liskov Substitution Principle, which is this. Um, I feel like it's pretty straightforward. So you just read it. Let Q of X be a property provable about objects of X of type T. Then Q of Y should be provable for objects Y of type S, where S is the subtype of T, right? Um, so if you saw me last year, I don't know how I get into I hate math. Like I was a math major in college, and I don't like math, and that sounded a lot like math. Um, and I, I did a talk here last year about math too, and I don't, I don't know why I get myself into this. Um, okay, so let's talk about this a little bit different. Liskov substitution principle. If it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, but needs batteries, you have the wrong abstraction. What is this? Easy softball question. This is a rectangle. Excellent. Um, that is not a trick question. What is this? Ah, oh, see, okay, you're jumping ahead. What else is this? This is a square. Thank you for not ruining my whole thing. Okay, uh, <laughs> okay, if you were to implement a, um, a hierarchy, a class hierarchy of a rectangle and a square, this is the example that's usually used when we talk about Liskov. Um, a rectangle or a square, which one inherits from which? Because, right, so you know the answer already, so you can't answer. Um, right, so ultimately we would say, you guys kind of answered it for me already. A square is a rectangle, right? But a rectangle is not a square. 
So therefore, they can't inherit in that direction, right? So um, let me ask you a question. What makes up a rectangle? Define for me, somebody, anybody in the room, define for me what a rectangle is. Four sides, four 90 degree angles. So a parallelogram has four sides and four angles. Um, but yes, you're right. Four sides, four 90 degree angles. Um, is there more requirements? Right. Um, two sides have to have the, the two parallel sides have to have, be the same length, which actually kind of is mandatory if you're going to do the 90 degree angles now that I'm thinking about this out loud. So that's fine. A rectangle or a square meets all of those same requirements, right? Yes. But what makes up a square? A four equal sides. So it has one extra thing. It has one extra requirement. So if a square inherits from a rectangle, you then have to add criteria that restricts the options around what it can be. So you're adding restrictions to that thing. So let's go back to this. Let Q of X be a property provable about, so it's the same thing. It still doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, but I just explained it to you using the square and the rectangle. Um, okay, so talk about this. So let Q of X, let Q of X, I promised I wouldn't do this, but I'm going to. Let Q of X be property provable, um, and then Q of Y should be provable for objects Y where the subtype. So if I have Q of rectangle, I should be able to pass Q of square into the same thing. So I should be able to pass square into the same Q and have it work the same way. That's the idea of Liskov substitution. Let me ask you this question. If I pass square into the same thing, is it always going to work guaranteed? No, because I have added requirements, right? I have things that are forcing it to change. And so that's not going to work. So it says um, it should be the same. So Q of X and Q of Y should work the same if S is a subtype of T. And it, and it still doesn't make sense, but it's fine. Because the reality is those are not the same. And the reason why this matters is because we're adding complexity, right? Because if we abide by the open close principle, if I'm going to pull stuff out and I'm going to make subtypes, I want those subtypes to be able to still be used wherever the other thing was used. That only makes sense, right? If all of a sudden they don't work everywhere else, I might as well not have extended it to begin with. So let's look back at this. I have a task. If our task equals, yeah. Same thing, same exact thing we had before. Remember, I created this new thing called urgent task. An urgent task replaced, if I, I made it because I wanted to replace task, did I do anything in urgent task? You guys remember, all I did was add a notification. I didn't change the behavior in any way. Can I still use this task, this new urgent task, everywhere in my application and not cause problems? Yes. If I changed functionality, if I said, hey, if you do this instead, now it, the functionality is going to be different. It'll break things. Now I can't reuse it everywhere. That's the idea. That's the problem we were trying to solve. And so Liskov substitution is simply a way to force us to think about how we're building our extensions so that things don't break. Was that close-ish? OK. I can't tell if that was reluctant or not. We can talk later. OK. Now we get into murky waters. Um, I don't know if this was a great idea to provide like free sugar and caffeine. Um, I'm going to be in a coma later. But uh, just sugar crash eventually. OK, so interface segregation. Interface segregation becomes murky for some reasons we're going to talk about. But, um, but realistically, uh, well, hold on, we'll get there. Um, we're talking about how things work together. And when we start talking about how things work together, 
that becomes um, interesting because we don't always own the things that we're inter interacting with. How many of you, let me ask you this question. How many of you own the entire scope of the code base that you are working on? There are a few lucky souls in the room. <coughs> um, not everybody can do that or can say that. So here's what I'm going to do. In, instead of diving in, because this becomes complicated, I'm going to tell you a story. I want to see if this resonates with you in any way. Okay, so this is the story of kind of how this segregation principle thing uh, came to be. So, um, so interface segregation essentially says this. No client should be forced to depend on methods it does not use. ISP splits interfaces that are very large into smaller, more specific ones. So basically, um, if there's stuff that I'm required to know about that I don't need, that I shouldn't have to worry about, I've got a problem. And we need to fix that, and we fix that with interfaces. Now, question, does JavaScript have interfaces? Right, just don't even answer. It's no, right? So this becomes a little murky, but, but we'll deal with it. Okay, keep your interfaces simple. In this case, when I talk about interfaces, I'm talking about Keep the interactions you have with other things as simple as possible. If I have to, to add complicated things, or I have to know about stuff I shouldn't have to know about, that first, that's a violation of single responsibility. It's a violation of, of many of the things we've talked about. Um, and it leads to things that are broken. All right, so I'm going to tell you a story. So Bob Martin, Robert Martin um, used to work for a company called Xerox. And what's interesting, I, the reason why I'm going to kind of walk through this is because every single one of you should resonate with, with this. Um, so Xerox had a new printer system that did a whole bunch of stuff. Think about what a printer does, or a, a, a copy machine. It can staple, it can fax, it can print things, it can do all kinds of stuff. Um, as the software grew, modifications became more difficult until it was impossible to continue development. So it, it ultimately violated the first rule, single responsibility, right? They had this thing called the job class. How many of you have ever had what, okay, so job class or let's say um, utility class or some mammoth thing that you had to interact with in order to get anything done? And that'd be, right, everybody has had this kind of thing. And so what happens is they kept having to make changes to this thing, and then they had to change their interactions with this thing, and it kept breaking. <coughs> um, because of the design of the stable job, how to know about print job, blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, and that became very problematic overall. Um, so the solution was the interface segregation Interface separation, segregation principle. Now my words aren't working. Um, okay, so here's what they did. They built a layer of interfaces between the outside world and this job. And they would create a print interface, and they created a staple interface, and they created all of these different things that the job class implemented, and then they would just use that. So everything now took a, an eye print or a eye staple or whatever and then dealt with it that way. They couldn't break up the job class because that ship had sailed a long time ago. Like legacy software, we all have to deal with it. But they built some interfaces on top of it that let it work the way they wanted it to work. Now that becomes difficult in JavaScript, right? Because we don't have interfaces. So what we do on the JavaScript side, um, there's a pattern that exists called the, um, oh, blah, blah, blah. I, there we go, called the facade pattern. And basically what the facade pattern is, is a way that we're, we write something that sits on top of, everything, of something that's large and greatly simplifies it. And so if you have this big monolithic thing, instead of having all your code have to deal with this big monolithic thing, let's just create something simple that does that work for us, and then everything references that simple thing. Um, and I'm short on time, so I'm not necessarily going to like drill it, but keep that in mind, is create simple interfaces. And in this case, interface just means a way to interact with something, not the actual interface thing. Um, 
to keep your code as simple as possible. Dependency inversion. Um, okay, so this basically means, um, right, would you, the cool thing about a lamp is that I can plug it into anything that looks the same, right? If I hardwire it somewhere, then I'm tied to that one specific thing. Um, like I can't move it across the room because I'm stuck right here. So the idea is to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, so here's the thing, high level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. Um, yeah, we, um, abstractions don't, abstract classes. How many of you use abstract classes in JavaScript? You're, right, you don't because, um, Okay, uh, so ultimately, this is kind of the idea, right? For us, for the very simplified JavaScript version of everything, um, if your code doesn't need to worry about it, don't make it worry about it. So kind of back to the single responsibility. Um, things should be passed in and executed. I shouldn't implement save. Right? I don't know what save does. I don't care what save does. I know that I have a, a pattern that says I'm gonna save something and I'm gonna let somebody else deal with it. I'm just gonna pass that off elsewhere. So if you're a React developer, this is normal for you, right? You're already doing this. So you can like feel comfortable that yeah, the patterns existing in the React ecosystem sometimes are good, sometimes are horrendous. But, um, but in this particular case, that's, that's exactly right. Okay. So with three minutes left, what do we do with this? Um, because ultimately the idea is you're not going to be able, we're never going to be able to go back and completely rewrite everything. So the idea is now you already have stuff, so let's spend some time walking through and, and figuring out this next thing I'm going to do, how do I do it right? How do I abide by these patterns? Are there things I can pull out or put in? Um, because... Right, how many of you have walked into a job and said, wow, this last developer was horrible? Um, right, all of us, everybody, because that's the way it works, right? Um, so your goal is to you know, make, make your code base a little nicer for the next person who has to use it, right? All right, so I'm John, thank you guys very much.